I fell in love with theater and acting and creating at a very young age. My dad would call me Dreamy Mimi because I would always be in my imagination somewhere. I've always loved telling stories, the art of storytelling. I would often create my own, whether it be acting out stuff or writing or imagining. That was just always something that was very special to me. My grandfather loved gadgets. He, he loved all things cameras and, and film. I remember finding like an old, it was like an eight millimeter projector. And I would set up the projector in the dining room area and I would watch these home movies that my grandfather would film. And I really think that subconsciously had an impression on me in having the, uh, the career that I have now as a, a, a filmmaker. You know, if he could see what I was doing now, I know he would be like, man, that's, that's really, that's really cool. My name is Jamila Yarbrough. I was born in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I had a really blessed, supportive, nurturing childhood. I have a younger brother. Growing up, we fought and we loved each other. We protected each other. <laughs> he was always just another best friend in my life. My parents, they just always encouraged me to believe in my dreams and that I could do anything. In fact, my dad always talks about like me as a child, how I would lay on my stomach and flap my, my arms as if I was flying when I was a little baby. And he says, I was always born to fly. I'm Brandon Yarbrough, and I come from the south side of Chicago. Growing up, I was, it was my mom, my dad, my two sisters, my older sister Erin, my younger sister Gianna. Uh, my dad struggled with, with a lot of different things, and he left and moved to Atlanta uh, when I was four years old, and then came back on my eighth birthday. And that was actually when my mom moved to California to take care of my grandmother, her mother. Both my sisters moved and I wanted to stay and decided to stay in Chicago. My parents were really good about teaching us to really celebrate our history. If there was a black history program happening at our schools, probably because my mom had um, organized it at home. My parents always were teaching us about our history and our culture and to celebrate where we come from and that we come from such a rich legacy. My grandparents were in education, uh, teachers. I think my family's emphasis on education really stemmed from my family's rich history. My great-great-great-grandfather was Frank Quarles, who was the pastor of Friendship Baptist Church in Atlanta. He opened up the basement of his church to host the first classes of uh, Spelman College. That went on to be a long line of women in my family. They all went to Spelman, my, my, my great-grandmother, my grandmother, all my, my aunts. It's a rich history that my family is proud of and, and one that <laughs> I would hear often. My dad is the son of sharecroppers, Daisy May and Walter Biggs. I'm just so proud of the legacy that I come from. I always remember the story that my dad tells where typically sharecroppers would have to wait outside the door of the landowner's house to be paid. And the landowners may be eating or doing whatever they want, feel like doing. So sometimes they would be waiting out there for hours and my dad said, my grandfather always had this confidence about him and this knowing and understanding of his value. And while everybody else was waiting, my grandfather walked up to the front of the line and knocked on the door and interrupted them while they were eating or doing whatever they were doing and told them it was time for him to be paid. Honestly, it could have gotten him killed, but for him, it did not. And they gave him his money and he left while the others still waited. And that, when I tell you that story stuck with me, and especially as 
I began to, to continue on my journey, not necessarily my career in the beginning, not moving the way I wanted it to, but knowing that I had something to say, it really taught me um, to understand my value and not be afraid to knock. My desire was to be a performer. And I remember going to the circus one day and saying that, <laughs> that is what I wanna do. I don't know who I wanted to be or what I wanted to do in the circus. But I just knew I was supposed to be up there doing something. I remember going on a trip to New York. This is my dream trip. I might've been in middle school or just starting high school and I wanted to go up to a Broadway play. That's all I wanted, to see a Broadway musical. I remember my dad coming back from going to buy the ticket, and he said, you know me, they, he calls me Mimi. You know me, they're sold out. And I was so hurt, <laughs> because that's all I wanted to see. And then he said, but guess what? They had tickets for Jitney. And I was somewhat familiar with August Wilson, but all I could think was, here my dad goes again. <laughs> All he wants to do is, is to see black artists. And at the time, I didn't know to, to appreciate how wonderful that was. Um, but I, was, I, want, I can't even remember what musical I wanted to see. That's all I cared about. I go to this uh, play with a little bit of an attitude. And I sit there and I watch Jitney. And I remember seeing the actress playing Rena, McCole Brianna White. I just knew at that moment, that's what I, I want to do. The way I felt, the way I was changed by her performance, it was so beautiful and amazing. And I knew at that moment, I wanna do that. I wanna be an actress. So one of the most beautiful things about my hometown is uh, the Black Theater Festival. I grew up going to one of the best festivals in the world. Our small town would have black legendary actors. I met Sidney Poitier, I met John Amos, I met Harry Belafonte, Denzel Washington, all the greats. The whole town was shut down and these actors and performers and directors would take over and we would just honor and celebrate them. I remember being maybe 11 or so, running after them with an autograph book and my mom being right there with me, supporting me. And it really sparked my love for especially theater. I just knew there was something, it just connected with me so deeply. I was fighting so hard, I didn't want to move to California. I wanted to stay in Chicago, and I remember it was in sixth grade, spring break. We, we flew to California, had a great time, had a great spring break, and the morning that I was supposed to come back to uh, Chicago, I was supposed to fly back by myself, and I, I just I couldn't do it. And my mom's brother lived with us for some for some time, and then he moved back to Chicago. Uh, but he left his stuff. I remember going into the closet and finding there was a it was a RCA VHS camera, and I was like, "Oh man, this is dope." My friends who are like like uh, brothers, Aaron and Jessamy, they would come over and we would film short films, come up with these crazy these crazy ideas. One of them was called Finding Tito. I played this character called Tito, and Jessamy and Aaron had to go find find Uncle Tito because their parents had died or something, and and so they they came down to Tallahassee uh, to come find old, old Uncle Tito. At that time, I had this this big old this big afro, and I would try to hide it under a hat when I didn't want to comb my hair. So I remember Tito had this big this hat with this big old lump. I thought it was funny at the time, but that was the genesis of us making these things. And but I basically taught, I taught myself how to edit. I started using Windows Movie Maker, and then I went to Sony Vegas. And I remember just editing these things together, and and you know being so excited to show everyone. I would I would burn them on to CDs and just give them out to to friends. I started dancing at the Artistic Studio, School of the Performing Arts. It was a studio there in Winston-Salem, and uh, the head of the program was Janice Price Hinton. That was just such an incredible time. I was late coming to dance. I started in ninth grade, maybe, and she just saw so much in me, so much more in me than I ever knew I had. Not only was I taking classes, she started having me teach classes as well. And that just ignited 
a passion using the arts, teaching dance, theater, drama, all forms of dance, you know, to youth. I then went to Spelman College. My mom is a Spelmanite too, she went. So I've been hearing about Spelman for Ever. I actually, for high school, went to an all-girls boarding school. I wasn't feeling going to another all-girls institution. <laughs> However, I went to visit for homecoming and I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with the school. I might have noticed the Morehouse a little bit too <laughs> across the street. I later made the decision to go. And honestly, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Man, it was just such a beautiful place where we as black women were just celebrated and honored. And one of the things that I carry with me today that was instilled in us, it was for us to be agents of the change that we want to see. It was wonderful to be amongst other black women who could run circles around some of what I thought were my greatest accomplishments. And it just pushed me further. after I graduated high school, I was like, you know what, I'm out. I moved back to Chicago and I just started living. I learned a lot just teaching myself, learning online. I think YouTube around that time had just come out and started dabbling in, in uh, music. And then I started DJing. My guy Thomas gave me my DJ name, DJ Yardbird. I was DJing and then I actually, I actually, um, I was working at Best Buy and and uh, I was selling digital cameras. I was in the digital camera department. And I remember falling in love with, uh, with photography. I found one of my grandfather's old film cameras. So I, I learned how to, you know, to, to take, take photos and tell a story in, in one frame. And I used his film camera uh, to do that. Following college, I went to graduate school. I went to ACT. I got my master's in acting. That space was just, I just worked with some incredible artists and teachers and peers that stretched me. One of the things that I'm most appreciative about being there, there was a small group of black students at the school and we often found ourselves at that time not having as much work or opportunities to dig into roles that we felt like we could really see ourselves in and that reflected our experiences. One of the great opportunities that came from there is that myself and, and another student at the time started a space for um, mentorship for us to bring in youth from the community. But we also started a space where we could perform and create and do tell the stories we wanted to tell, things that we had written, things that um, we wanted to play. I'm just so grateful for the space that ACT gave me and other artists to really explore our voice. I really know that impacted me so greatly moving to LA and oftentimes still not seeing those roles that I long to see, where I could see myself, where I could see my family or others that I knew, their experiences depicted. And I know my upbringing just led me to that point of knowing, gotta create, gotta create a space. 